Okay. And can you kind of go through some of the path and that patho anatomy of these fractures? Because we always, you know, hear that, you know, a lot of these hip fractures have predictable um, fracture displacement based on the soft tissue attachments. Can you kind of just talk about, you know, some of the patho anatomy behind these fractures, what's important and, and things that we should definitely know about? Sure. I think, uh, you know, anatomy is the key to everything. Anatomy teach. It's a great teacher. Um, the more stable standard intratrochanteric fractures, uh, I tend to think of it as the femoral shaft uh, falls away from the proximal femur. It shortens and externally rotates. And so when you think about your reduction move, maneuver for a more simple intratroch fracture, it's traction to get the length back and then it's internal rotation of the femoral shaft to bring it up to meet the proximal fragment. So again, the, the anatomy that makes sense. And then in this uh, cartoon that you have, this is sort of a classic subtrochanteric fracture uh, where it exits more distal, distal to the lesser trochanter so that the lesser trochanter is attached to the proximal fragment, giving it that classic flexion moment. And then the pull of the gluteus medius and minimus give it abduction and external rotation. So this is a really a common clinical scenario and then also a really common test question. They'll ask you about the deforming forces on it. It's, it's good to know those things, but then you also have to translate that into the ability to uh, overcome those forces in the operating room. And there's a lot of different strategies to do that in terms of how you position the patient, how you apply fixation, what reduction aids you use, things like that. Um, I think a, a constant thing to remember is where, what is happening with the greater, or I'm sorry, the lesser trochanter. Frequently we see the lesser trochanter fractured off. So you don't necessarily get that flexion deforming moment of the proximal fragment, but it's important to look when it's still attached because it can give you a really aggressive flexion deformity of the proximal piece. Okay. So just to recap for those listening, we're talking about our different, uh, our different fragments and our proximal femur fragment It'll go to abduction because of our abductors and our gluteus medius uh, and minimus. It'll go in to flexion because of our iliopsoas. Then you have our external rotators that'll externally rotate that proximal fragment. And then that distal fragment will go into adduction because um, you have the adductors um, working, on, working on that. Right. And typically, at least for our simple fractures, our technique for close reducing these is going to be traction and internal rotation to allow that distal fragment to kind of meet up with that proximal fragment. This is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. And then definitely pay attention to the lesser choke enter because if it's still intact, you can have even more, I guess, degrees or, or varying um, moments of flexion of that proximal piece. Now, um, what I always read about the door classification. Is this, what, what, what should we know about it? And I guess, can you kind of go through it and then tell me some of the things or the important things to know or how we should use this information? Sure. Like uh, <clears throat> door classification, it talks about the, the morphology of the proximal femur. And as you get, as you go along in classification, A, B, and C, uh, it's indicative of osteoporosis or osteopenia you see a widened femoral uh, canal with thickened cortices. The bone is increasing its radius to try and main to maintain strength uh, as the cortices are thinning. So it's a really common pattern uh, in geriatric patients and certainly in osteoporotic patients. Uh, and I think it, it has implications. It, it may tell you how, how likely someone is to fracture. It may also tell you about uh, what you need to prepare for if you are uh, planning a surgical repair. Certainly the x-ray uh, more on the left-hand side and the door A classification. If you were to put an IM nail in there, you'd have to be prepared to ream quite a bit more, but you'd also know that you would get really great diaphyseal engagement of the nail. Uh, whereas go to the other side, the door C femur, uh, you wouldn't have to do as much reaming or any reaming, but you may also lose out on that diaphyseal fit uh, of the IM nail. So you may be relying more on your cephalomedullary screws or interlocking screws for stability. Ah, okay. It makes, makes perfect sense. And our door A is when we have our thick cortex and the door C is with, I guess, that classic stovepipe um, yep. appearance that, that we definitely hear about. And, you know, just considerations for an A, you may have to ream a little bit more uh, versus a C, you may not have to ream as much, but that, that, that lateral cortex, that proximal cortex may be a little thin so you're kind of depending a little you may be depending a little bit more on your implant and because you know that's definitely a little bit more osteopenic or osteoporotic bone 